So welcome again uh, to everyone here joining us today. Please take a minute, if you would, and introduce yourself in the chat, who you are and where you're at and your connection to Central. Um, this is our third Thursday's Lunch and Learn, um, where every month the Central community, um, students, faculty, staff, alums, friends of the seminary, gather to learn about scholarship, ministry, personal interests, um, and uh, especially today, important issues facing our community. Because it is lunch and learn, you're invited to eat your lunch um, as we move through our time together today or whatever meal or snack it might be time for in whatever part of the world that you are in. So we are happy today and grateful to have with us Reverend Dr. Ruth Roselle, who serves many roles at Central, including Director of Contextualized Learning, Associate Professor of Pastoral Theology and Counseling, holds the Diane C. Schumacher Chair of Peace and Justice, and is the Director of the Buttrey Center for Peace and Nonviolence. And so today we are grateful to experience Dr. Rizal's wisdom on the urgency of the climate crisis and how we can respond as people of faith. So Dr. Rizal, I turn it over to you. Will you join me in um, welcoming Dr. Rizal today? Thank you. It's delightful to be with all of you con people concerned about the climate crisis and um, to think together about how we should be responding as people of faith. I know you're busy, and so I appreciate you taking this lunch hour um, to be together. I am going to share a screen here where I have a few slides while I talk. Can you all see that okay? Okay. And does my my pictures on the side interfere with your seeing the screen? No, you're okay. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so we are going to address today, um, I'm going to address three questions that really kind of emerge out of the title that we have, the urgency of the climate crisis, responding as people of faith. And those questions are, why is climate change now a crisis with urgency? Why should people of faith respond? And how can people of faith respond? So I'm just gonna talk for a while. And if you happen to be eating lunch, just go ahead and eat. And then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time um, at the end. I'm not a, I'm too old to be very multi, good at multitasking. So I won't be, I won't see anything in the chat if you put it. So just go for something really important comes along if you could monitor that because I don't tend to be able to do both at once. So um, let's talk about this together. Um, but before we do, I want us to do, um, use our imagination a little bit, okay? So what I want you to do is to engage your imagination to envision a world that can be after we have addressed the climate crisis. Okay, such a world would no longer use fossil fuels. Imagine a world where all the energy is renewable using wind and solar of which there is abundantly plenty. Our electric cars would be quiet with little maintenance, um, quick uptake to zip around the cars on our, our two lane country highways with less danger. Those walking in the streets will smell clean air rather than gas fumes, and they'll enjoy a quiet walk because electric engines or e electricity will, um, will power the lawn mowers, so they'll be very quiet. The sky will be bluer. There won't be toxic leaks that pollute the oceans and the land, so the land will be healthier. With the needed reforestation, animal and bird life will probably be renewed, so there'll be more bird song. And when we start cooling down the carbon in the atmosphere, hopefully, perhaps the oceans will even become cooler and the coral be able to be more fully restored and the fish and all the life that happens under the sea will further evolve. And in the process, we may have learned how to reduce our energy use and learn new ways of sustainable living. So it can be a cleaner, more beautiful, more healthy world than we even have once we get past the climate crisis. 
So keep your envisioned world in mind. It can give hope and energy. It is possible because we know what we need to do and we have the technology to do that, although there's new technology always being developed. But to get to where we need to be, we need to face reality and we need to ask the question, why is climate change now a crisis with urgency? So the situation um, that we are facing is one that has been in the making for quite a long time since the industrial age, but especially during the last few decades, there has been a great increase, a dramatic increase in the burning of fossil fuels and fossil fuels are the largest contributor to global warming pollution. Right now we are spewing 162 million tons of human-made global pollution into the really quite thin shell of our atmosphere every single day, as if it's just like an open, endless sewer, which it certainly is not. And so the little blue line there is uh, the, the um, greenhouse gases uh, atmosphere. Um, what happens then is that that layer of greenhouse gases is thickening because there is more of um, the various carbon dioxide, methane, different um, greenhouse gases out there. So it is thickening so that more of the heat that is coming in or the energy that is coming in from the sun is staying close to the earth rather than leaving. Um, really, previously there have been a balance at least for the while that humans have, have been living on the earth, the amount of energy coming into the sun and the amount going out was pretty much equal with just the right amount of naturally created greenhouse gases holding enough heat to warm our planet so that it has this magnificent capacity to support life. But with the increase of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, different other ones, it's created an energy imbalance that is causing the earth to warm. So that the global temperature now is 1.1 degrees centigrade above previous levels. So that may not sound like a big number, but it takes a lot of energy to warm the whole earth um, with its land and oceans. So up to this point, we may not have felt as strongly the effects because about 93% of the heat's been absorbed by the oceans and some parts of the earth are warming faster than others. So like the Arctic regions are warming faster than probably what we are experiencing right now. And that's why there's a lot of melting occurring. But the effects of this global warming are start to be experienced everywhere. And we're talking about this a lot, so you're quite familiar um, with this. Warmer oceans increase the speed and the destructiveness of hurricanes and the amount of precipitation that they release. Hotter temperatures over the land increase evaporation, which dries out the land. But then that what is evaporated contributes to this, this downpour of rain in other areas that causes flooding. Hotter temperatures cause more lightning, striking on forests that are drier, so we have more ferocious wildfires. And of course, all of this affects our capacity to raise crops that feed people. It affects wildlife um, in ocean and land and how they can survive. It affects our health in very many ways. So we are increasingly seeing these effects and connecting the dots to understand that the greater threat of these natural disasters is related to climate change. And scientists are warning us that there are indications that we are getting into serious trouble. I'm gonna mention just a few of them and I'm not a scientist, so I'm repeating what others have told me, but um, uh, there, there's some warning signs. One is, of course, that um, disasters are increasing. Here's a graph showing worldwide extreme weather disasters. And you can see as the years go by, they're getting um, more and more frequent. And we, we know that from the news as well. We know that temperatures tend to rise along with carbon levels in the atmosphere. And in in, as this graph shows, and I want to, I should um, know that a, 
a number of these graphs are coming from the Climate Reality Project, which, which does a lot of the research. Um, but as you can see on these graphs, they're during human existence and, and a long time before, we have ranged between like 180 to 280 um, points per million of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That's where we have been um, for a long, long time. But now we are at 415. And you can see what is happening there. It's gone pretty much straight up, isn't it? <laughs> um, so we are at a level that we haven't been at before. And this is very concerning. Furthermore, 19 of um, the 20th hottest years on record have been since the year 2002. And the hottest of all have been the last seven years. The fear is that um, we will be reaching tipping points where there will be sudden climate changes that cascade um, to more rapid irreversible changes than anticipated so that there could be a really sharp increase of greenhouse gases and global warming and, and all the consequences of that. For There's a number of possibilities, I don't know all of them, but even like, for example, the, the melting of glaciers, if that suddenly speeds up and we have a lot of, um, not only sea level rise, but when the land is cleared in the north there, in the tundra, there's methane underneath and that can be realized. So there's a number of tipping points that we're kind of worried about that are, are the pressures building up toward them. So we need to be attentive. No, I know, it's also down here. Okay, so um, an another reason that we need to be really concerned is that Despite all the talk um, within and between nations and the accomplishments that have been achieved, and there have been some very significant accomplishments, greenhouse gases continue to rise. Even if nations keep their promises that they've made at the Paris and Glasgow climate summits, scientists project that instead of bringing down greenhouse gases, there'll be still an increase of 14% over the next nine years. So what this means is that it's really unlikely that we'll be able to keep the global temperature rise to just 1.5 degrees centigrade, which is um, the desirable most amount we want for a good climate. It's more likely, even if people are trying to keep their promises that it's gonna rise to 2.4 to 2.7 degrees, according to what I'm reading. And one um, UN Fast Facts information sheet on climate change stated that the current path of carbon dioxide could increase global temperature by as much as 4.4 degrees Celsius. So that is very concerning. Dr. Robert Davies, um, who is a physics professor at Utah State University and works with the Utah Climate Center, helps us to see what we're facing in this, in this graph. And I have to say, um, I, this is a screenshot from a video that he did, so let me give him credit. And these videos are on a new organization called C3, Christians Caring for Creation. It's got the link there. And I'd encourage you to go there because um, in 15 minutes he describes just in lay language that we can understand about climate um, change. He's got also quite a number of little videos that are really very helpful for understanding all of this. But here is what he um, has visualized, um, just what I said um, earlier, and that is if we work really hard at reducing carbon emissions, we can potentially keep within the plus one to plus two range. And you can see at the very bottom of the green, it's starting to slant down. We've, we've reached the point where it's, where it's gotten to the most, and then we're starting to draw down. And so the, um, there's a very nice possibility if we worked incredibly hard that carbon emissions would level out and maybe even get a little bit lower and we would be, we would be doing quite well. If we continue on the current path that we are taking, we are heading for more like the four degrees centigrade rise in global temperature by 2100. 
And I don't even know how to quite describe that, but it'll be significantly um, bad, <laughs> let's say it that way. And um, as you can see, it's still going up, right? It's not leveling down. It's not like we'll get to four and then it'll go straight. Nope, it's going way up. So the temperature will continue to increase at that point. So this is something to consider. There are, this is from the NASA um, Visualization Studio, Scientific Visualization Studio. And again, these are screenshots from um, Dr. Davies' video uh, that I encourage you to watch. This shows what a low carbon future would be. Um, close to 2100, where we just, we're rising four degrees Fahrenheit or around two degrees centigrade. And what could be the future if we do nothing, which is a much, much hotter future. And here is those kind of projections that are done um, with soil moisture. So you can see with modern emissions, we're still getting a little bit drier, but with high emissions, our current path, a lot, Will get drier. So when we talk about higher temperature, we're not only talking about heat waves, we're talking about all these increased natural disasters like I just mentioned. And when we talk about the driest of the earth, dryness of the earth, we're talking about having food and water enough for everybody, particularly those in that area. So what is needed? What, what makes this an urgent issue is that as a world, we really must address it immediately. And we're not too good at doing that, actually, as, as you well know. But the next five to 10 years is absolutely critical for the future. And it's not we can't stall it off 20 years and then do five to 10 years of hard work on it. It needs to be done right now. The sooner the better. It'll be less expensive and less will be lost. And it, so in order to have a livable form climate future, scientists are saying we need to cut our greenhouse gases by 45% by 2030 or roughly half, then we need to cut them again in half by 2040 and then cut them again in half by 2050 and move toward um, kind of a zero carbon future. What that means, at least for this decade, is reducing greenhouse gases by six to 7% per year. So that's quite a, a push, um, but that would lead us to um, a much more favorable climate future. The Glasgow Summit did accomplish some meaningful things. It, it, it didn't accomplish some things we needed, but did um, and quite a number of nations, I think 100, promised to reduce methane by 30%, which is really good because that has also gone up. It's very potent, 80 times more than carbon actually, but it dissipates from the atmosphere more quickly. They, quite a number of nations promised to reduce cutting down forests, including people like places like Brazil, which is really good because we need them to absorb the carbon. And they promised to work toward eliminating fossil fuel subsidies, which is good because look what it's been like. <laughs> Look at the difference in how much renewables have been subsidized around the world compared to what fossil fuels are being subsidized around the world. This is something that could be changed quite easily, maybe. <laughs> um, there's reasons why it hasn't changed so far, yeah, but it's something to work for. So it's an urgent situation that needs to be addressed. It is what I would call a crisis. So a crisis is um, a crucial time, an unstable time in which a decisive change is impending. It's a turning point at which the trend of future events is determined for better or for worse. It is a time in which we need to act immediately. It's a critical time when our decisions make a really big difference. And if we make good decisions and good actions, it can lead to good outcomes. And then we do that about, think about that in terms of crisis management as leaders of congregations, but it's also true in terms of the climate. We are in a climate crisis and it is urgent that we address it. And it's urgent, I think, as people of faith and faith leaders that we address it. Dr. Davies, along with other scientists say that we have all the technology that we need to do this, more is being developed, but what we lack is political will to do it. And what we need is a massive people's movement to change that political will. 
And it seems to me that people of faith and faith leaders should be at the forefront of such a movement, even as at times they have been with other social movements in the past. So why do I say that? Why do I think that um, people of faith should be right at the forefront? Well, first of all, um, our Genesis 1 narrative, and, and I am speaking as a, as a Christian, um, our Genesis 1 narrative of our origins tell us that God created the earth and all that is in it and greatly delighted in it and declared it all very good. So if this is God's earth. And according to the same Genesis 1 and 2 narrative, humanity was created on the sixth day along with a lot of other land creatures once everything was in place. And the description of humanity's creation in Genesis 2 emphasizes our interconnection with the earth. It is from the soil of the ground, and the Hebrew, where is, Hebrew there is Adama, that the first human is formed in Hebrew, Adam. This little wordplay reminds us that we are made from the elements of the earth. Our bodies are made from the soil and they return to the soil after death. Our lives at its most elemental level is intricately interrelated with the land. We are part of this earth. Further, according to Genesis 1 and 2, God's initial instructions to humanity was to cultivate and care for the land or the words could be to serve and preserve it. We are created in the image of God to function as God's representatives in the world. Under God's sovereignty, humans are to exercise dominion, not dominating, using and abusing the earth in any way we desire, but rather by um, functioning as God has given us a unique capacity to do and empowered us to do in carrying out God's benevolent reign in overseeing and caring for the earth. The Hebrew word translated have dominion, rada, according to Old Testament professor Terence Fratham, means must, it must be understood in terms of caregiving, even nurturing, not exploitation. And he suggests the word subdue, kabas, means um, here to cultivate and to develop its fullest creational potential. I think I am engaging in kabas, subduing the earth when I am pulling out my weeds in order that my plants can grow um, in the garden. This means that people cannot simply use and abuse the earth in whatever way they want to. Duke Professor Ellen Davis writes, the earth is neither a platform for human activity, nor a repository of resources to be mined at our convenience. Far from being inert, the earth is living and responsive to God. It generates life, putting forth vegetation in response to God's command. All those whose lives came, as people whose lives came from the soil and, and, and we continue to be intricately interconnected with the well being of the earth as those made in the image of God, as those designated agents of God's benevolent reign, as those given the power and capacity to act on God's behalf, we are to be caretakers and master gardeners of this earth. So its beauty and abundance and balance endure for all future generations. We have been given that special capacity and mandate to do this. So I don't see the climate crisis as simply a scientific problem or a political problem or a global problem or a national problem. It's a spiritual problem. The initial instructions that we humans received the first, among the first commandments that we were given according to our sacred texts was to be God's caretakers and stewards of the earth, preserving this paradise as home for all creatures. And I think these scriptures express God's great respect for humanity and creating us as partners in caring for the well-being of the earth. It's why we were created, it seems. It's our special role. And we are needed to step up to this special role now more than before. Furthermore, just as God loves us, 
God loves the earth and everything in it. So John 3, 16, often quoted, God so loves the world. Um, I think we often think that means God so loves people. Well, that it, the word there is cosmos um, in Greek. And cosmos has a lot of meanings in Greek. If you have pages and pages, if you look it up in the theological dictionary, which I did, um, it ranges all the way from the cosmos, as we think of cosmos, to people or people who are uh, against God. You know, so there is a range of meanings. I do um, admit that. And, and maybe in this particular verse, it does mean people. However, surely God, who is love, God loves the cosmos. God loves all of what's on earth, not just the human people. Um, it, God loves the animals. God loves everything that's been created. And if God loves all that's been made, then, then we are to love what God loves as well. Another reason I think about is that we experience God through nature. And that is a, another good reason to treasure and care for it. Um, through God's creation, we experience God. The psalmist in, in Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens are telling the glory of God. And don't they do that? Um, nature isn't simply material and physical. It mediates and is alive with the spiritual. So think of all the times in scripture that God is revealed through nature. To Moses in a burning bush, to Elijah in a sound of sheer silence, as NRSV puts it after nature's wind, earthquake, and fire. Think of how often Jesus went into nature to be by himself and discern God's presence and wisdom. Think of yourself and how nature has touched and replenished your spirit and reveals to you the splendor and the wonder and the mystery of God. As we grow in our love for nature, joining God in loving it, we will want to care for it. Furthermore, the primary message of Jesus was about the kingdom or reign of God. And he taught his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. The prophetic writings, especially that of Isaiah, lie in the background and flesh out a picture of this kingdom of God, where life on earth is as it would be if God reigned in its every aspect, if God's will was done. Under God's reign, there's justice and peace between people in harmony with nature. War is eliminated. Oppression is gone. The earth is flourishing and abundantly providing. People and animals live peaceably together. Think about the Isaiah visions. And every person has enough goodness and joy. It's a compelling, although seemingly elusive future that Jesus calls us in following him to bring about into being. But it becomes incredibly more difficult to imagine in the future that faces us without addressing climate change. Most Christians and people of other faiths understand that part of faithful living in response to God is helping those who are in need. In that familiar passage in Matthew 25, Jesus identified himself with those who are most vulnerable, the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, naked, the sick. And what we do for them is what we are doing for Jesus. People who are currently suffering and dying because of the climate crisis. And it is going to get much worse unless significant action is taken. And it is especially the poor and the vulnerable that are and will suffer the most. When weather disasters happen, it is the poorest who do not have the money to escape and they suffer. When crops fail and prices rise, it is the poorest who don't have enough to eat. When there are extreme weather events, life-threatening heat waves, it is the poorest and the homeless who don't have ways to cool down. There are, will be many more climate refugees seeking a home. If we as Christians feel we should help those most in need, we must address climate change because it is making their problems 
greater and causing ever greater need. The climate crisis is also a justice issue in so many ways, not only within our own country do the poorest suffer the most, but there's gross inequity between nations as the Glasgow COP26 um, summit has highlighted. Developing nations who have emitted very few greenhouse gases are feeling the effects and suffering the most with the fewest resources to respond. Wealthy nations have emitted by far the most. And over the course of history, the United States has been the greatest emitter. We've emitted about 24% of the total um, human-made greenhouse gases. Of course, as people of faith, we should be concerned for the future generations in the existence of humanity. It is really an ex existential crisis. If we don't respond appropriately, Earth's conditions could be much more unhospitable for life in 2100, which is the, you know, our children, our grandchildren and our great grandchildren and the children after that. And finally, um, congregations and church leaders have been concerned and they have mourned the absence of younger generations, haven't they? We've been talking about that a lot and there's probably a lot of reasons for that. But we do know that the climate crisis is an issue, not only of great concern generally, but especially for young people. A 2021 Pew Research report found that 76% of Gen X respondents said that climate change was one of their biggest societal concerns, and 37% said it was their number one concern. But if churches are not even talking about it or doing anything to address it, how likely are younger people to think that they care or that they have any relevance to them or that they are important for the well being of the world. So let's move on. We could go on. Some of you have other reasons, I am sure. But let's go on to just talk about how can people of faith respond? And here are just some of my thoughts. There's just a ton of ways, but here are some of my thoughts. First of all, I think we need to get educate ourselves about the climate crisis and its solutions um, if we're going to deal with it. Um, we're not going to put time and energy into responding something that um, we don't really face up to as occurring. Um, and there's some good reasons we don't want to face this, to be honest with you. It's pretty frightening. It can feel pretty overwhelming and we can feel powerless. But understanding the threat the climate crisis holds for us can also energize us to action. And understanding how the dots are connected between greenhouse gas emissions and disastrous weather events can make us more confident to talk about it. At the same time, we really need to understand the solutions that are there for us. We probably all know some, but there are many and they can contribute to the health of our planet. So I know for myself, what enabled me to jump in and really engage this issue is that I became part of a group that learned about the drawdown solutions that have been scientifically determined to be helpful. Um, and Paul Hawken has this book. Actually, there's another book that just came out um, sitting on my desk here that continues on talking about some of these solutions. Knowing about these solutions gave me hope and positive energy and guidance as to what needed to be done. And it helped to spark a vision of what a good future um, could be. And it's also, let me show you, um, I'll just show you a couple of slides here. So here's like, they rank the top 10 um, of the different kinds of things and they have all the scientific calculations about what it would reduce and what it would cost and all of that. Um, here's all of them put into um, this kind of graph. You can see there's a lot of different possibilities and um, all of them are important. But of course, each one of us can only kind of manage uh, focusing on one or two or a few of them. So I encourage you, Drawdown has a lot of information as well as I'm sure there's other places to go as well. I also think it's important to do this in the midst of a community of others who are similarly concerned and working on climate action. There are things we can do individually and they're very good, but it's a very big problem. 
and will require much more than we can accomplish alone. And so being in community can give us support and encouragement for what we do as well, help, as, well as you know, help us build friendships and enjoy the life that we have together with similarly concerned people. As I mentioned, we know much of the solutions and have much of the technology needed. What is lacking is political will. Much needs to be done that has to be legislated, budgeted, and regulated by our leaders at all the different levels of government. Fossil fuel companies and big businesses need to be taken on. So what is needed is an engaged citizenry and the development of a massive people's movement to affect the culture and the political wills so that they boldly address the climate crisis. And surely we could be out in front um, doing that. So it helps, really helps, because it's a complicated issue. It helps to join a community or coalition of concerned people working on climate action at whatever level you feel especially drawn to. Deep changes are needed in our country and many groups are working on them. For example, I did go this past weekend to an online um, conference with the Citizens Climate Lobby. Their focus has been to try to get the adoption of a carbon fee and dividend at the national level, which would basically increasingly tax carbon, but return the money to people in the form of a dividend so that especially those who are poor are not hurt by that tax, but it would incentivize businesses to keep reducing the amount of carbon that they're using. There's all, you can join a denominational group. Many of our denominations have groups like that. Blessed Tomorrow is a interdenominational group that a lot of the denominations related to Central um, are partners in. They have a wonderful number of resources and training. I mentioned C3, Christians Caring for Creation, a new group that's working hard to provide resources and, and opportunities. Green Faith is the interfaith international group. We had the executive director speak at our last climate conference, um, doing a lot of good things. And then there are groups that are not only addressing climate change, but are, um, addressing it in the context of other justice issues, especially for poor people. And that's the Poor People's Campaign would be a good example of that one. So there's a lot happening. Can't do it all. Maybe we could do one, uh, work, work with one group um, to, work, to work on our concern. In addition, um, at whatever level we can, it's great to be a part of working with others um, as a coalition or a mass movement um, to, to really put pressure on Congress to pass the legislation that we need that will address climate change. And, and these coalitions or these different groups can help us know what we need to do. They do the analysis and give us the alerts and all um, so that we can become more active citizens. We also can, we can work within our political party um, yeah, find out which candidates are for, you know, strong climate action and register voters and help them know how to, who to vote for in terms of climate. And there's, there's a, a lot that can be done there. Can join a group working at more of a local community level with the issues. And there's tons to do there from transitioning local energy to more sustainable sources, to building codes, to building transit electric transit and, and so much more. We can also um, work within our sphere of interest to get others engaged wherever we are, workplace, social groups, communities, groups, family, friendship, educational institutions, congregations. Um, now I realize this can be a little tricky <laughs> and you wanna still have good relationships with people, right? Um, it needs to be done sensitively. And, and we need to realize that um, talking about climate change really can raise people's equal anxiety um, and, and a sense of angst and, and maybe even make them shut down and didn't, because they don't want to deny, they want to deny all of that because it's uncomfortable. It can get us right in the middle of political polarization. So we need to be careful about it. But it also, we also need to engage more and more people in this movement. So in talking with people, it's important to listen, to ask questions so that we understand the other person's perspectives and to figure out what they're concerned about. More and more people are increasingly concerned, but we need to discover how each person we talk to thinks about it 
and how we can build on what their concern is. So maybe, like here in Kansas, maybe we need to talk more about renewable energy, that renewable energy will be healthier and provide jobs and be less expensive, rather than talk about addressing climate change. So we have an organization that does much more of that kind of thing, um, the Climate and, and um, Energy Project. It may help to have our own climate story that shares why we are concerned about climate change in a personal way. We're just giving our own story, our own testimony, if you will. Um, I think we need to work hard to talk in a way that holds out hope and provides opportunities for action because action provides hope. Um, fighting about this, arguing about this, putting people down about this um, doesn't help. It doesn't help at all. So we need to go about doing this in a way that actually is helpful. Congregations, I think as congregational leaders, those who are, we need to take seriously our influence and responsibility to provide leadership in this area. There are many biblical and theological themes that can be addressed in our teaching, preaching, and worship. People need to understand the imperative to care for creation as part of our Christian calling as people of faith. We need to help nurture the love of nature, maybe in our worship, maybe by some events in nature that help them to really love nature more. We need to provide opportunities for people to be educated on solutions and how to go about engaging in actions. I think people also need to, in our congregations, need to see that working on the climate crisis is a big part of our mission that actually embraces our other ministries and missions. So it's part of caring for our children, our children, and the children of our neighborhoods and world. It's part of caring for the most vulnerable nationally and internationally. It's part of expressing our concern for refugees and undocumented migrants, which are on the move in large effect because of climate change. It's part of working um, for justice. And then I think as congregations, there's much we can do in our life together. So congregants can learn a lot as they make their building and congregational life more um, heading towards zero carbon emissions. And this provides a model then for them and their families. Things like energy efficiency, using LED light bulbs, electrifying all appliances, the heating cooling units, putting on solar panels, installing charging stations in the parking lot, eliminating plastics, recycling, composting. There's so many possibilities and funding, hopefully will increasingly be available through future legislation. And of course, there's a lot that we can do personally. And it's important for us to do so and to invite others to join us as we aim for net zero carbon living we are working to live the hopeful future now, to demonstrate the possibilities and to support our words with the integrity of our actions. So depending on your life situation and your financial possibility, I mean, there's just so much um, in transportation. You know, if you've got the resources, maybe your next car could be electric. And um, if your energy source has enough renewables, and let me tell you, they're pretty fun to drive. Because <laughs> I like, we have little country roads and I really like getting around the cars I need to pass fast. But there's just, they take up so fast. Um, we need to walk more, bike more, use transit if we're in the city, um, avoid air travel. There's lots we can do in energy and there's, there are some credits and resources for solar panels. We need to work toward electrifying everything. Um, paying attention again to the, the amount of renewables in our source of energy, energy efficiency, decrease our use of plastics and what we buy, like plast uh, um, fossil fuels and what we buy, like plastics or what could be called plastic clothes in the fast fashion. Um, look at our diet. Uh, unfortunately, the raising of, of cows um, is, is part of what's at the heart of cutting down the Amazon. So decreasing. Um, beef and, and all of that with the emissions that they create and the problems that they're causing and work toward a plant-based diet. I guess there's no big rules here, but just every little thing we do is helpful. And um, reducing waste, just buying what we need so we don't send stuff to the landfill, all sorts of things um, that we can do. 
But most of all, in the midst of all of this, I want to encourage you to take time to care for yourself because this is a hard issue, right? Um, take care of yourself, treasure those you love, savor the goodness of nature around you often. It will renew you. It'll energize you. Be compassionate with yourself as you grieve what is being lost. Focus on a few things that you can do with others. Look for signs of hope at what is being accomplished. And there are many that we could talk about. And then of course, as people of faith, we place our hope ultimately in God. So that is what I have to share, which was probably more than enough. <laughs> but I, oh, I do have one other thing. I would love, I have a few questions that um, I, I'm interested in your answers to, although you want maybe want to talk about something else. But here are a few questions that I have that maybe you'd want to respond to, or maybe we'll send you a questionnaire. <laughs> um, what do you need in order to move forward in taking action? to address the climate crisis, what do you need? What do you need in order to help your congregation address the climate crisis? How might the seminary and myself personally be of help to you? And what are you and your congregation doing to address the climate crisis? So those are um, especially, what do you need to move forward? What do you need to help your congregation move forward? How can we be of help? So I'm gonna stop that um, sharing and give you time now to make comments. Some of you, I'm, I'm seeing a, a scientist there <laughs> that may have so a lot more that can add to this. <laughs> that, um, and I, I certainly welcome that. So there may be comments that you wanna add to this. There might be questions. There might be some responses to the questions that I have um, asked you. So what would you like to talk about? What, what thoughts do you have? What questions, what comments? First, just to say thank you, Ruth. What a, what a lot you've put into this presentation and I really appreciate it. Um, Thanks, Rita. I should, I should have I, taken. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say I should have taken a picture of your questions so I could refer to them again. <laughs> oh, is that part of what? Yeah, I'm. I'm just. I am curious. Um, I think probably probably everybody on the screen, um, is already concerned about the climate crisis. I just maybe up the ante a little bit, um, or reminded um, us again. So maybe you can share what you are doing to address it. But if you feel like you should be doing more, what would help you get there? Or what would help your congregation do that? Is there anything that we could say seminary that could be helpful to, you know, get that, that oh, thank you, Jessica, get that, um, uh, facilitate that so that we keep contributing to this movement of concerned people that are willing to do what, what is needed. And the biggest problem I see is that we have a lot of people who don't believe that this is real, this climate change stuff is real. And so the biggest thing is how do we convince them? Hmm. Yeah, you know, that number actually is going down quite a bit. I don't have the graph in front of me, but I saw it recently at this weekend conference. Um, the ones that are dismissive, is totally dismissive is like down to about, according to the survey, like 9%. And then those above that, you know, kind of questioning or not sure, you know, don't think it's important. It's there's some more, but it's really shifting to people that are, are really um, increasingly concerned. It's moving in that direction. But yes, there are still, of course, it's some of that's, there's been a huge disinformation campaign um, by fossil fuels and, and companies, because of course, this is, totally threatening to them. And they have very much kind of bought out, to be honest with you, a lot of, a lot of um, legislatures. And, but there has been, there's been a lot that has 
been put out there to confuse people about whether it's actual or not. Um, yeah, so that's one thing. Uh, one, one thing I would say is, well, you know, it doesn't work to fight and argue with people, but you might you might figure out where are what you know what some of their concerns are. Um, sometimes it's just that they notice that the world is the climate's just a little weird or different, and um, just maybe providing some facts that or asking them questions, listening and asking them questions uh, is better than arguing probably with them to try to convince them. Um, some people have gotten bad information sometimes, but you know, is it normal? that the Pacific Northwest had that gigantic heat wave that we've never experienced, like it was a one in a thousand year heat wave where people were dying in the Northwest this summer, you know? So just kind of raising maybe questions about that. But I don't know, what, what about the rest of you? What have you found works <laughs> um, if people are actually denying the reality? Oh, the other thing is to be aware, you know, there are some, a few little scientists probably connected to the fossil fuel companies, although it was the fossil fuel company scientists that initially saw that there was a greenhouse effect with fossil fuels and that information was, was hid. Um, but I mentioned the, um, Dr. Davies in the uh, character creation website. He has a nice little one about three minute video there about the science, the, um, kind of the evidence and showing all the studies that have been done about what climate scientists believe about this. And um, so he cites it and, you know, it, it's ranging between like 98, 99% of scientists, sometimes 100% of all kind of societies or national organizations related to climate um, or science, they all are affirming that it's human made. Um, pollution that is caused in, in climate, climate change is real. So um, yeah, that yeah, might be helpful to you to realize, I mean, it's it, among scientists, it's not debated at all. Um, and we, you know, the same thing that, I mean, we trust science for a lot of things. People do. We, every time you go to the doctor, you're kind of trusting science. You get on the airplane, you're trusting science. <laughs> Dr. Davies says, if you use a smart form, it's the same equations, <laughs> you know? Um, so we trust science. And then for some reason in this thing, it's because it's political, because it's disinformation, people don't trust 98 to 99% worldwide scientists that are saying it's happening and it's human cost. What has been thrown back at me is we went through this ice age, so the earth is gradually warming anyway. So this is just a natural phenomenon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And I mean, we did go through an ice age, right? And, and I don't know the whole geological aspects to that. But I do think, um, I mean, if you look at some of those graphs, like I guess when I first went through this training um, at Climate Reality Project, those graphs felt kind of convincing to me. Um, and scientists really do know that carbon holds heat, you know, increasing the carbon levels of our atmosphere hold heat. Um, so yes, there, there are different cycles the earth has been through and we've really existed on earth only a short time. And we may throw that into something else through our activity, but it, I mean, there may be another cycle. <laughs> we may not be a part of it, but it, it, it does seem that, I mean, scientifically that the carbon is known to hold heat and the global temperature is also rising. So I can understand if you can die, deny that, then you don't have to do anything. And maybe it's, um, it feels simpler, but it, the scientists aren't really saying that. Bill, you're a scientist. T help the, us. <laughs> okay. The uh, ice ages are largely driven by variations in the Earth's orbit as it goes around the sun. It, how the, the wobble of the Earth changes the axis and so, that sort of thing. The, the, the big difference between, and evolution has, has tracked those that uh, 
ice ages and the warm ages in between ice ages have not produced mass extinctions. But the big difference now is we are changing it so fast. Instead of the change occurring over a thousand years, it's occurring over a decade. And evolution does not have time to uh, change us and change uh, the biosphere to keep up with things occurring that rapidly. Thank you, Bill. I think the issue for me in the church is it, in, in my situation, everybody believes in it. That's not the question. It's just whether that's a, an issue that the church needs to invest in, uh, invest its energy in. Um, I have nobody that doubts it, nobody who questions it. It's just who will make it a priority enough to work on it. And it's, that's really where I'm at. Um, because we've been saying in, in our situation in Boulder, Green Faith is very active <clears throat> and is a good group, um, which I've been involved with some, but we haven't had the church commit to be part of it. Um, and so that's just the, you know, what my situation is, how do I, um, we, I think we need to do some education and just bring people along. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think your idea of, you know, choose one organization, get involved and do something is probably a key thing. Um, yeah, you, you know, it's a wonderful advantage that your whole congregation um, accept it, its reality and has some concern for it, because then you're at a point where it's more trying to figure out what to do and whether it's important to do it, I guess. So there are some educational pieces potentially that you can be involved with. with I mean, I kind of shared some of that with you um, in terms of kind of the, the theological biblical pieces and the solutions. But I think what really does help is is you know working with others being a part of something bigger than ourselves but if your whole congregation can be part of you know to do some things um, part of a movement and, and maybe it's the whole congregation starting out doing something together congregationally that isn't overly hard or complicated you know but but working together you can be a part of that movement and green, having a green faith circle there is is a great beginning too and and one of the things we have just and actually we are in the midst of it um but Boulder chose All We Can Save, um, the book to um, use as a focus for a discussion this year. And um, <clears throat> so I am sponsoring a group through the church, but doing it by Zoom, which has allowed people to bring in others. So it's about half and half church people and half and half friends and neighbors. And Great. And so that's been, it's a wonderful book if anybody is interested. A book of about four. Monday. <laughs> good, good. I just heard about it at that, that same conference. She was one of the yeah. speakers. So that is a great, yeah, just a book club like that. There are several wonderful books that can both inform and inspire. And she has, that has some very inspiring passages in it, I know. In that book. Great idea, Mary Beth, I think. Working together on your own, you know, church building or congregational activities in small ways sometimes can help raise, you know, be act, raise awareness and then people think about bringing that home as well. Although I do have to say part of, all of that is important. It's really important. It helps us do something, but we also need to keep in mind that really our, our, our we've kind of been told that those smaller personal actions are most of what needs to happen, right? If we all recycle, then it's going to be okay. In reality, there's some huge structural changes that need to happen. You know, big companies are the major polluters, you know, all sorts of things. So we do at this time of life, we also try to keep in mind, how do we be a part of, you know, whether it's just this um, citizen climate lobby is kind of a good group because they're very focused on this one carbon tax and the graphs that show the effect, which I didn't have one of those, but it actually will make a big difference if we can just get it through Congress. You know, so there's like one action 
that if you want to write letters and be a part of groups and you know visit your congressman, that that could actually make a lot of difference. But you can join that group, that um, Citizens um, Climate Lobby, CCL group, and get training and find wonderful companions. They have a great spirit about them of, you know, of very kind of, I don't know if it's a Christian group, actually, I should look, but it, it very kind of, we're going to do this through love kind of approach. And they're very focused on this one. They think maybe it might be there. I think they have 49 votes out of 50 <laughs> getting it some kind of climate tax in the Building Back Better plan. And if they do, then they're going to go really doing research. What's the next one or two other things that will make a difference that we'll really focus on. So that might be one possibility. I think I'm going to, I'm going to, um, more actively participate in that group as a way to help me get kind of steered and focused in one way. Yeah. Well, it's one, does that mean everybody has to go back to, to work? <laughs> Quit talking about this. I wanna thank you all. Yeah, actually, no, it's not always easy to talk about the climate crisis. Um, it can be, it can be sad. On the other hand, it's pretty fun to find other people that are concerned. So I do really appreciate your presence here today in engaging the subject. And please know I'm very um, committed to this one. So if there's ways I can work with you in any way, then, then be in touch about that. Jessica, I hand it back to you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Rizal. Uh, will you join me in giving a round of applause to Dr. Rizal for sharing this with us today? Um, both the urgency as well as how we can respond. Um, it was great to see so many in the central community here with us today. Um, just a couple announcements about um, third Thursday lunch and learn. Uh, we won't have a, a lunch and learn in December, um, but we look forward to having you join us in January when we'll kick off the new year with Dr. Yan Sung Lee. And um, he's a uh, supplemental professor here at Central, and he'll be leading us in exploring the crossroads of Western missionary literature and Korean studies. Um, and so we'll have the information and registration up on the Lifelong Learning page on Central's website pretty soon so that you can register for that. Um, but again, thank you all for coming today, and thank you especially to Dr. Rizal for your advocacy, advocacy and action um, in this area and for challenging us to, to further action. Everyone take care. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.